Well, good morning. Welcome to Woodland Shores. We're so glad that you're here, and we're so glad that uh, we have some people watching online. We're, we're glad to be able to join together as a church and worship the one who is worthy. Um, we had an excellent vacation. Thank you so many of you for asking. It was much needed. It was very hot, but um, it was excellent. We had a blessed time, and we got to rest and relax. It was fantastic. Um, I don't know how your week was. I hope it was like vacation. I hope it was good, and I hope that you had uh, a wonderful time uh, growing in the Lord and continuing to pursue His purposes for your life. Uh, but right now, I have a couple announcements, just some things that actually our fall is starting to wind up, which is actually really good. We're excited about. Uh, we've got some things that we're planning on that we want to invite you to and invite you to, to participate in. Um, one of the things uh, that you may have heard about yesterday if you came to Carl Stasinowski's funeral is that uh, Mike Wilson did compile about 15 songs that Carl sang here um, at Woodland Shores, and he has made some CDs, and uh, he's willing to make them available to more people. Uh, all you got to do is there's going to be a sign-up sheet um, on that table where you got your um, packet today. So if you're interested in that, let us know. Otherwise, you can always let the office know if you're watching online, um, and you can let them know, and we can prepare a CD for you. Um, we do ask, you know, because there is a little cost to that, that, you know, a buck or two to help us offset the cost would be wonderful. Um, second thing, uh, we're going to be having membership class uh, coming up soon on Saturday the 24th from 9 to 11 a.m. And uh, if you've been thinking about becoming a member and you've just kind of been hemming and hawing and delaying and maybe not making that decision, uh, now's the time to at least explore what membership means. Learn a little bit about our history, learn about what membership means, and if that is the next step for you. Even more exciting than that, we've been pondering how during this co time of COVID, how we could possibly do Fall Fest, one of our biggest outreaches of the year. We've been racking our brains on how we could best do this, and uh, one of the solutions that we came up with was not exactly to do Fall Fest as we have been doing it and letting people come in the building. That just wasn't going to be very functional since we've had 600 people in the last couple of years. Uh, it's been quite packed. We said, let's do something outside. And we decided that we'd love to do a, trick or, a trunk or treat. We've done trunk or treats in the past as a church. And uh, if you're not familiar with what that is, you decorate your trunk um, of your car with uh, whatever decorations you may put up there. And kids come by station by station, car by car, and receive candy. We're actually going to have a little bit of a competition for that too. Who has the best decorated car, our best decorated trunk. So please uh, consider signing up for that. Uh, we're going to have a um, uh, ability to register online for your vehicle that you're going to be participating. But even before that, just like we do for Fall Fest, we're also going to be needing pre-packaged, individually wrapped candies to be donated so that we can all hand them out. You're welcome to bring your own to your trunk, but we'd also like to have some extra in case we need it. So uh, we'll have a table available for you to put that in uh, in the coming weeks. So that's awesome. We're excited about that trunk or treat, and we hope you sign up and participate in that. Um, also, one of the other things that we'd love to be able to do is we'd love to take another step in kind of progressing towards opening our church. And one of those next steps is it's a baby step, almost literally, uh, we'd like to be able to open the uh, nursery and pre-K. Uh, but we need some helpers for that. And if you have been a helper and you've been thinking about it and you're not sure, uh, please uh, pray, prayerfully consider it and let Lori know because we'd like to start it next week if possible. And, and that will begin kind of our process. We'd like to see that open, then some kids' classes open, then ABF's back and other events coming back. And we'd like to see all this progressing along as the Lord wills, right? That's how we have to make our decisions in this time. So uh, please be in prayer for that, and, uh, and if you are interested, again, contact Lori. Those are your basic announcements for today. Uh, of course, you know, I know we all have so much more going on in our lives week in and week out, but let's intentionally take some time right now to slow down, to wind down, to refocus, to bring ourselves consciously um, recognizing God's presence here with us today. Let's go to him in prayer. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can enter into your presence through the blood of your Son. We thank you that you provided this mode of communication and communion with you, that we can have this intimate, ongoing relationship with you at all times. 
Thank you for being the God who loves us and loves to hear from his children. Lord, you love to hear our praises. You love to hear our prayers. You love to hear our thoughts, our wishes, our dreams, every part of who we are. And so we bring them all to you this morning. Our anxieties, our stresses, every bit of it. We bring it all before you and we lay it all down at your feet. Recognizing that you are sovereignly in control of our lives in ways that we can't see or understand all the time. But we know that you are. And we know that you're faithful and that you're good. And so help us to trust you today and the rest of these days. Help us to trust your provision, the way that you've provided for us day after day, exactly what we need, exactly when we need it. And even more so, for your provision of your son, Lord, help us to trust you uh, as we receive your forgiveness this morning, as we recognize your great love for us. Lord, challenge us and, and meet us here. Speak to the depths of our hearts and challenge us in the way that we respond to your word. Speak to us, Lord. Don't let us leave here the same as the way we came in, but challenge us, sanctify us, cleanse us with your word, because your word is truth. We love you, Lord Jesus. And we just ask that you'd be exalted on the praises of your people, on our offerings, on our listening, on every part of today. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Morning, boys and girls. It's nice to see so many of you here today, and I know a lot of you are still watching at, at home, online, maybe. Who here likes money? Anybody? Okay, Rich, Rich is the first one to hand up. We all like money, right? How many of you maybe have something like this? It's, it's a piggy bank, or a, it looks like a safe, but does any of you kids have one of these at home? Maybe you put extra money in here, you're trying to save up for a big expense, yeah? So then that's good. You know, we've been talking about plans these last few weeks, and saving is a good thing to do. And you're going to hear a little bit later, there were some people back in Bible times that had lots of money, but they were greedy with it. They didn't want to share it. Have you ever had a brother or sister maybe want to borrow money because they needed something and, and you had more than them? I see some head nods going on. Well, you know, these people didn't want to share their money. They didn't want to help those that were poor and needed help. They didn't, they didn't want to use it to do the things that God wanted them to do. And so I, I want us to think about that. You know, God, everything that we have, all the money we have and everything we have comes from God. So we should be generous with it. We should share. We should help the needy. We should give it to those that need it. And it's okay to save because, like, we've been talking about, we should make plans and let God direct our paths. Um, but just make sure that we're not loving the money that we save more than God, because God is the one we should love above anything else that we might have in our lives. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for all the many things you give us. And whether we consider ourselves those that have lots of money or little money or wherever we fall, we know that we are rich in you. We pray that you help us to remember to be generous with our money and our things and help us to not put anything, any of our stuff, our toys, our possessions, our money, none of that should go above you. Help us to worship you each and every day more than anything else. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so it is time to worship. So if you're able, um, would you stand and join us? And I don't know how about how your morning has been. Sometimes, you know, we come and the mornings are busy. Example, I forgot my coffee on the stage. Um, that's how some mornings are, but I love just coming before the throne. This is our chance to just let go, to quiet our hearts, to focus to, to worship him with everything that we have and just to be so thankful for what our Lord has done for us. So let's sing these songs out this morning. Joy to the nations 
God, we are so thankful for your greatness. God, no matter what is spinning around our lives, what is going on in this world, we know that you are constant, that you are good, that you are great, and we can trust in you. So God, would you just please help us this morning to listen to your word and your truth for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Do you remember the old um, commercial that goes a little bit like this? What would you do for a Klondike bar? And, and they ask all sorts of different stuff. Thank you. You guys sang wonderfully on that. Good job. Um, uh, yeah, and they would ask people to do all sorts of stuff. Would you cluck like a chicken? Or would you, would you act like a monkey? And the person on the street would do exactly that until the host gives them that ice cream bar. It's kind of crazy. So what did their dignity cost them? <laughs> a Klondike bar, which is about 55 cents uh, at present. I checked on Walmart. Uh, it's about 55 cents uh, for their dignity. And if you can buy someone's dignity for so cheap, uh, what do you think people might do for a little bit more money? Right? What do you think people might possibly do? Well, there's one man named Billy Gibby who got really creative, and he decided to become... Billy, the human billboard. Um, he basically auctioned off different parts of his face and his body to be tattooed with a company's logo or website. Some of the spaces went for around $300. Some went for around uh, $1,000. That is, until the prime real estate, you know, on his face and everywhere people could see was taken up. And then it went down to about $75. He wasn't making a lot of money off it. And I believe he gave up after that. But... Um, so many of the websites on his face were for casinos or, or porn sites or other illicit things. And I can't imagine going through life with all those tattooed on your face for everyone around you to see. Sure, it's free, real, uh, free advertising essentially for them, but for you, you're marked for life. On the other hand, uh, you've no doubt heard of Gary Dahl, right? You know who he is, right, everybody? Um, he made about $15 million in six months. Can you imagine that? All by selling pets. Well, pet rocks. Do you remember that phenomenon of pet rocks? He basically claimed that these pet rocks, that he would he put instruction manuals in the box and he'd grab a rock from somewhere, I don't know, and put it in the box and say, this pet rock is so much better than having an actual pet because you don't have to take it out and walk it, unless you want to. Uh, you don't have to change its papers. You don't have to do any of that. It's so convenient and easy, and he made millions by selling people rocks. Uh, just before I say anything further, anybody here ever buy a pet rock? Okay, okay, um, good. I'm glad you didn't, because you know you could probably go find one in the yard right now, um, and it would be just as good of a rock as the other ones that he was selling. Um, it's a little bit ridiculous to think about, but there's all sorts of entrepreneurial ways that people have sought to make money. The most ridiculous and frightful one that I heard was where one entrepreneur decided to sell his soul. He said he would divide it up into 100,000 shares and sell each for a buck. Each for a buck. So in other words, he's, he viewed his own life as worth only $100,000. And now he actually still is, keep going with this, he's still is living it out. He has a website where his shareholders vote on his major life decisions. Isn't that kind of crazy? I mean, $100,000 is drastically undervaluing anyone's soul. And by the way, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you can't sell your soul. It's been bought already, just to be clear on that, okay? So don't go trying to do that. Um, yet, a lot of people in this world will essentially sell their soul. They'll forfeit their soul in order to gain the whole world, or at least maybe a slice of the pie, a little bit of it for themselves. In fact, um, there's a lot of ways that we make tiny, subtle compromises that we don't even realize in order to get wealthy or to acquire a little bit more comfort, a little more security in our lives. And in our study in James, we're going to see exactly how far some people might go and how riches can cause conflicts, how, how when you're extremely wealthy and as 
Lori mentioned, selfishly hoarding for yourself, it is putting you at direct opposition to God's kingdom. It, we've already seen how there can be favoritism within the church when we look at the superficial outsides of someone and we say, wow, they're, they're blessed, they're wealthy, they're doing good, and so we lift them up and give them a nice seat in that place. We treat them nicely based on all those superficial reasons. And so wealth can corrupt even within the church. And a couple weeks ago, we did talk about the mild rebuke. I say mild in comparison to what he's about to get into. The mild rebuke of some traveling merchants who were making their plans without God as the center focus, right? They were making all their plans to go and, well, get rich. They were going to go and make money wherever they went, and they were going to do what they decided to do when they decided to do it without consideration to God or really in consideration to others or other effects in their environment. So now (laughs) James is going to crank his prophetic voice up to 11, right? He is going to turn the dial all the way and then some. Uh, With the harshest warning that we're going to see here in all of James in respect to those who chase after their wealth without regard for God and without regard for others. And today we're going to see that wealth without God will destroy you especially when attained the wrong way for the wrong reason. Wealth without God will destroy you, especially when attained the wrong way for the wrong reason. Now, as we dig into this bold prophetic warning, we have to be careful not to do what sometimes we're prone to do and and pretend that this is a message for our rich neighbors, you know, the ones living down by the lake with their giant mansions and, you know, wonderful lakeside view. This is a message for all of us. Uh, There's warnings in here from their negative example to even the poorest, most middle class among us because there are always traps that we can still fall into even in our envying of wealth. So let's listen up to James' warning about uh, wealth without God. Now, verse 1 of our passage today in chapter 5, it actually echoes something that we've already read a bit earlier in chapter 1 where uh, James warns the rich, right? He says uh, the the poor should take pride in their exaltation. Meanwhile, he says the rich should take pride in their humiliation because they're not going to last long on this earth since they will pass away like a wildflower, he says. And so he kind of laid that out and said, here's some destruction coming your way. Be careful. Be humble right now. And in verse 1, of chapter 5, now he's starting to get into the face of the rich people, especially the wicked rich people. And it's not clear that he's calling them to repent exactly, but he's saying, hey, be prepared for what is coming your way. Be prepared for the price of corrupting wealth. He dispenses with all pleasantries and polish here. He doesn't say, hey, let's reason together. Let's just talk this out, guys. Maybe, maybe we can come to a good conclusion on this. No, he says, listen up, you rich people. Weep and wail because of this misery that is coming on you. He's issuing a wake-up call for them if they would respond. And it's interesting because we've been talking about the different groups that he's been addressing all along, um, like when he addressed the traveling merchants, he, he kind of said the same thing. He said, hey, listen up, you who say this, that, and the other thing. And yet this time it seems a little bit different. If you look at the whole context, you begin to wonder, are these people that he is addressing actually believers? If you judge them strictly based upon their actions, as we'll look at in just a little bit, um, how they use their money, it's clear that their lives don't reflect kingdom values. Now, if by a long shot they are believers, then it's clear that there's an area of sanctification in their life that the Lord is working on, right? It's clear that um, they have not yet brought this aspect of stewardship of how you wisely deal with money in this life under the lordship of Jesus Christ, right? They may still have some remaining idols that they still need to tear down, that they still need to repent of. But truth be told, you know, we got to be careful about this because we don't want to judge other people in this, right? We want to still hear what is being said, but we got to recognize that all of us come broken before the Lord. When you came to Christ, you didn't come all of a sudden perfect. (laughs) 
right? You didn't drop every single bad habit and just, man, from then on, no sin ever again. That didn't happen for any one of us. No, all of us are bring our brokenness and our sin sickness before the Lord for him to do his supernatural soul surgery on. And I love that he does that for us, don't you? That he continues to be at work in us, perfecting us, drawing us closer to him, helping us to shed those sins that we might become more like Christ. And I want you to look at this intense response he is calling for from these people. He says, weep, weep, and wail. This word weep in the Greek um, means to cry from the depths of your heart, profusely crying, not just a little, oh, I'm sad I got caught doing something bad, but to weep at the weight of something horrendous, coming disaster on the way. And then this word wail is crazy because it means to howl, to shriek in terror. Have you ever done that at something awful heading your way? At, at the even prospect of, of something awful, of, of grief? Have you ever howled? Cried out to the Lord in such a way that it's wailing when you cry. A lot of times those go hand in hand, the weeping and the wailing but what are they weeping and wailing about? Where is this thing coming from? What is this thing that they're afraid of? Well, I have to believe that this, is, this misery that James is speaking of is eternal judgment. It's coming their way, and all the wealth that they thought would protect them, that they thought would bring them security in the time of hardship, that would protect them from all misery, isn't going to do it this time. There's no buying their way out of trouble this time. Would you do me a favor and turn real quick to 1 Timothy 6? 1 Timothy 6. And, and I kind of want you to hold your thumb there, and I encourage you this week in your own devotions, in fact, the memory verse is coming from that, in your own devotions, spend some time meditating on 1 Timothy 6 and what Paul is instructing, is instructing his protege, Timothy, to teach to his people in their view of wealth. It's pretty impressive. But some of this is going to be very familiar to you, and so I'm going to Try and read it carefully and make sure I say only exactly what it says. He says, Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and trap and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Why is this? He says in verse 10, uh, For the love of money is the root of all evil. Wait, no, that's not right. It says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's not just money is the root of all evil. Money is an amoral object, right? Money in and of itself does not have a will. It's what we do with money and whether we love money. And he says, it's not the root of all evil because if it was the root of all evil, then we'd all be just doing things sinfully to get paid. And most of the time we aren't. Most of the time we're just doing it either to protect ourselves or... Um, because we're feeling rebellious or because it brings us some sort of pleasure. But we're not doing it for money. But isn't that impressive? He says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, in verse 10, and some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. The temptation to love money more than you love God or more than you love others is real. It may not be an actual physical love of money like Scrooge McDuck. You know, he physically loves collecting and hoarding money. It may not be exactly like that, but it may be the idol of that comfort and security that that money represents for you, the pleasure that it brings you. But still, Scripture says that if you live to chase after that idol of riches, you can't simultaneously worship God, right? You can't worship both God and money you got to pick between one or the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. And if you choose wealth, you'll find that it is eternally destructive in ways that you may not comprehend. It will lead you away from trusting in your provider, the Lord God Almighty. It will lead you away from him in trusting in him in general, feeling like you are safe and secure in these worldly ways of wisdom which we've already said, do not fulfill. They do not match God's wisdom and God's provision. I, I, I just 
had a thought just now of uh, a conversation I had recently about um, one of my camp founders. Uh, if, if you've ever been to Camp Barakel, I, I loved it. I, I served there for two summers. Um, it was wonderful. And, and Johnny Johnson, who founded the camp, they made us read his whole uh, book, his whole biography, in, in order to be a counselor there. And uh, he was kind of like George Mueller, if you don't know who George Mueller is. George Mueller had an orphanage, and he uh, would pray for God to provide what he needed week by week, day by day. And miraculously, things would show up. And the same thing for Johnny Johnson. They, they would run out of toothpaste. They'd have maybe two cents to rub together, and that's all they would have. And they'd run out of toothpaste, and the next day, they would open the door, and it'd be right there at their feet. They'd pray for it, and it would be there. God would deliver it. But so many of us don't really believe like that, do we? That God will provide what we need when we need it? We very rarely do. In fact, that's why we so easily fall into this idol of wealth. That's why it's so destructive. That's why it tears us away. And that's why it pierces us with so many griefs. You've heard of the lotto curse, right? Where people who enter the lotto to try and win, they wind up actually being poorer than before they entered the lotto. Because all of the people and friends who wanted to mooch off of them wound up stealing, harming, robbing, doing whatever they could from them in order to get the money so it left them with even more grief than the joy that this wealth was supposed to bring them. When we read about how destructive wealth can be, it should send a little bit of shiver up our spines as we talked about the fact that we live in a nation that is in the top 75%. You know, if you have the very basics of what we consider the American dream. If you have just those basics, a running refrigerator, clothes, health, money in your pockets, then you're in the top, top 75% of the world. You are wealthy. And so we need to check ourselves to see if we are acting anything like these people that James is talking about. Because in verse 2 and 3, it, there's a terrible truth of, of knowing that your wealth will destroy you. That's our second point today. You may have uh, heard the story of how you hunt a monkey. Have you heard about that? You hunt a monkey essentially by taking a coconut and cutting a hole just big enough for the monkey's hand just to slip through, right? Just big enough for it to slip through. And then you, you carve out all the contents and you empty it out completely and you put a little treasure or a trinket or some sort of sweet treat inside of that, right? And then the, you tie that coconut to a tree, and the monkey tries to reach in and grab whatever it is and pull it out. But the problem is his hand has expanded in just trying to hold on to that treat or that trinket. He tries to pull it out with all his might, but he cannot get out. And he does not give up. He does not quit easily. If he just let it go, he'd be free. But he's trapped in easy prey for any hunter. I think that's a lot like many of us, not just that we got our hand caught in the cookie jar and we can't pull it out, but so many of us, when it comes to our wealth and, and even some of these values, these subtle values that we've adopted in our lives, we are stuck believing and we need to pry open our fingers to release them, to let them go so that we aren't consumed with selfish desire and destroyed. The same can be said for the people in um, verse 2 and 3. So let's look at those together. Look at what he says about their wealth. He says, Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. Whew. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? I want you to get this word picture in its fullness, though. Um, what he's talking about is, obviously, we have a, a stored-up treasure, an abundance of stuff that we have put, socked away for our future, that we've put our faith in. It's a picture of, at first, stored-up food, right, that's gone rotten. If you've ever had this happen, uh, in our move, we actually uh, had our, our garage refrigerator uh, filled with some food, and then, then uh, we had to bring it to our house. But for a little while, it sat in the truck because our closing was delayed. And then we opened it when we got to our new house. Oh, my goodness. There were unholy smells <laughs> that came out of that thing. Um, but that's the idea of, 
of the rot that happens to our food. Like in a refrigerator, you think you stored it all up, but the power went out, and overnight, your food has become rotten, leaving nothing to eat. And then the second picture he gives then is of a closet full of clothes. He's like, you have all these clothes stashed away, more than you need, and yet because they're all stashed away, because you've been hoarding all this for yourself, all of those clothes that are too numerous to wear have been eaten by moths. It's destroyed. All that you thought was your security and your covering is gone. And then again, I want to return to that image of Scrooge McDuck, right, and his bank vault. Because I think that's a wild thing to think about. If you've ever watched DuckTales or, or any of the Disney stuff with Scrooge McDuck, yeah, I know some of these guys over here have. Um, you're going to marvel at the physics where, where this duck dives into and swims through all of his gold coins. And I have no idea how that works because I would think he'd break his neck when he first dives in, or he would be crushed by it as he's sw trying to swim through it. I have no idea how that works. But he has a huge bank vault that has an amazing security system, and he, he protects it with his life. He stashed it all away, and it's all filled with money that he's probably never going to spend. He's just holding on to it for another day. And what's wild, what James says about the gold and silver that these wealthy people have stashed away and kept for themselves, he says it's going to corrode. Now, we know something about gold and silver, right? It doesn't really corrode like some other metals. It actually more or less tarnishes. It loses some of its qualities. It may pit over time. But um, in this case, he says it is so corrupted, most likely because of the way they got it. It's so wicked, uh, blood money or otherwise, that it is also eaten up it is destroyed over time. It's corrupted and tainted, and it poisons them. That's kind of the image that he's giving, that this wealth is going to testify against you because it is also going to eat you up. Can you imagine that? Your wealth is going to eat you up. It is crazy how this uh, great surplus that's just sitting there testifies to their greed. And we'll look at that more in depth in a little bit. But the reality is, he who dies with the most money still dies, right? He who dies with the most toys still dies. Those toys then go off to someone else or they rot and disappear. They do not last forever. This is that lack of eternal view that these people have, that they're not seeing it in this way. Even more so, this money that they have gained in illicit ways is going to testify against them in God's court of justice. It's going to testify against them in God's court of justice. All that they've hoarded, all that they've held on to, all that they've been greedy to keep, it's going to work against them. It says it's going to eat their flesh like fire. That reminds me of a, a really common icebreaker. Maybe you guys have have opened with this in a discussion in your small group before or whatever. But um, if your house was on fire, what would be the one thing that you would take out of it or run back in to go get? What would be the one thing that you'd get? And many of us would say, oh, my pet or, or uh, you know, my favorite trinket or thing or my, my photos, I'd want to get that out of there. It really indicates very much so what we treasure most, doesn't it? What we value most in our lives. But in the case of these rich people, man, their grip was like that monkey. They would not be able to let go of any of it. They would go down with the house. They were too possessed by their possessions, and so were destroyed. My sister's pastor's house burnt down while they were on vacation. Can you, I can't even imagine that. We just got back, and so that would have been awful. I mean, we've had floods and other things, but the whole thing burnt down would be insane. But her pastor's response to the tragedy was right. He said, it's just stuff. He was able to let go of it. Yeah, they miss the memories and the photos and the things that they're never, ever going to be able to get back. But they let go of the stuff. Perhaps we need God's help to begin to pry our fingers away from our death grip on those things that we treasure the most. That we love more than other people that we love more than sometimes even God. We need him to pry that away so that we might release that idol and find the freedom God desires for us. 
Let's look again at the rest of verses 3 and uh, all the way through 6 to see how uh, the wealth in this passage and the wealthy people in this passage acquired it in a wrong way and how they used it in a wrong way. Uh, So we'll look at the wrong way and the wrong reasons as our next point. I've said it before a couple weeks ago that being wealthy in and of itself is not a sin. It may be that God has entrusted you with a tremendous responsibility to manage that wealth for his glory, but not to just hoard it for yourself, but to use it for the sake of others. And and scripture is replete with tons of godly, righteous people who are actually wealthy. Abraham was no bum, okay? He had a lot of money. So did Job, so did Joseph, so did David, and so on and so on. Various righteous men throughout Scripture, had a fair amount of money. And yet they viewed it in a different way and they attained it in a different way from the people that we're going to read about right now. Look at the charges that are levied against these rich people. He says, you have hoarded your wealth in the rest of verse 3. You've hoarded your wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. The first accusation is that they've hoarded their wealth, right? We've already kind of talked about that. That doesn't mean like they have a a habitual psychological need to just compile all sorts of junk around them. This is wealth. This is money. This is selfish things all used for their their selfish pleasure. So don't confuse that kind of hoarding with that one from that TV show where you see people breaking in and and trying to clear out a house that you can barely walk through because it's laden with newspapers everywhere you go. Things that do not add to the value. No, these people are, are, are with closets full of clothes, piles of money, all decomposing, all working against them. They've selfishly built up these riches and they're holding more than they need. Instead of being a generous conduit for the gifts they receive, they are instead selfish reservoirs, just collecting it. Their stores of wealth and uh, piles of clothes all spark joy for them, right? Right? If Marie Kondo came to them, they'd be like, I can't let any of it go. What are you talking about? This sparks joy, this sparks joy, this sparks joy. I love it all. It makes me happy. And it's really disturbing that it makes them happy because of how they got it. They got their riches through fraud. James says uh, that they would hire these day laborers, these workers, and they would work all day long in their fields harvesting, sowing, doing all the labor, and then at the end of the day, they wouldn't pay them. That is one way to get rich quick, by the way. You just simply don't pay your employees. But it's an awful practice because they deceive their workers. They promise them pay, and yet then they rob from them what they deserve, what they have earned. This is injustice. This is unjust treatment. They lie, they cheat, and they steal all just to build their kingdom. Scripture warns again and again against such selfishness. We'll talk about it a little bit later. It it warns again and again against such treatment of your workers. Notice that James says that God hears the cries of those workers. They're crying out to the Lord at this injustice. And what should really scare the people that are committing this horrible crime is that the Lord Almighty, as it's translated in NIV, hears. In other versions, it may say the Lord Sabaoth, which is not the Lord of the Sabbath, but it's the Lord of hosts. The Lord of angel armies heard. Let me tell you something. You do not want to be on the wrong side of the almighty, all-powerful warrior king with a vast array of heavenly soldiers at his beck and call. You do not want to be on the wrong side of that army. That should send these wealthy people shaking in their boots. But if you add to their hoarding uh, the wrong way that they acquire their wealth, the fact that they are using their wealth also now for 
purely self-indulgent purposes. So they can live a life of luxury, inconsiderate of any suffering around them, just tune it out in your little castle, hiding away from all the needs of everyone else around you. As I said, this puts us at odds with God because what is the greatest command of God? The greatest commandments are love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Not love yourself with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and wealth and ignore your neighbor because he's not yourself. He's saying, love your neighbor. You are now at odds with God, at odds with the Lord of hosts. You're a lover of yourself and you're looking at your life as if pleasure is the ultimate purpose of life. That's not it. I was thinking about this uh, yesterday a little bit at the funeral, and it just struck me again that one thing Carl didn't do was just live just for his own pleasure and building his own kingdom. He wasn't an incredibly wealthy man. He would give and give and give and give in care and love and pour out his life for other people. And he didn't stop. He didn't ever retire from that. Right? Because you don't retire from being a Christian. You don't retire from Christian service ever. You continue to serve as long as you have breath because you want to be found faithful when the Lord God Almighty comes or calls your number. So these people, they look at this as if they are feeding their own appetites instead. Very, very different. In fact, it says that they're getting fat off the work of others. James describes them like a fatted calf on the day of slaughter. Let me tell you which creature you would least want to be on the day of slaughter. Right? You do not want to be the juicy, tender, plump, robust calf on the day of slaughter. You do not want to be that. And so, Christian, I want to urge you to think about this in another way. Do not envy the wicked. You remember the psalmist when he looked at the wicked and he's like, look at them. They're, they seem to prosper in all their ways. They're so healthy all the time. They look so luxurious and, and well filled out. I wish I was like them. And then what does he do? He looks to the temple. He looks at the temple and he, he, he reorients himself to look at things in a kingdom mindset. And he says, but they're like grass. But their fate is destruction. And he decides it's so much better to follow after God when he observes their destiny. James already said in uh, chapter 2 that these wealthy people are doing some wicked stuff to other people. They're exploiting their workers. They're dragging them into court because the wealthy can afford the best lawyers. They can bribe the juries and the judges. They can um, take their poor neighbors to court and their poor neighbor cannot defend themselves. Essentially, when they take them to court, what they're doing, again, is then robbing from their poor neighbor. Even if their poor neighbor has a justified complaint against them, they demolish them in court and just become wealthier. It's despicable and disgusting. It's not the way it should be, but that seems to be the way it is on this side of heaven at this time. Now, what's awful about that is, this is what I believe James is trying to describe in the fact he says, you have murdered the innocent ones. Those who've done nothing against you, you've murdered them. By taking away any possibility for their life, you've committed a tremendous injustice against them in all of your hoarding, in all of your keeping it to yourself. In taking them to court, you've done a tremendous injustice to them. And I think we see this really well illustrated in Jesus' parable of the rich man and Lazarus. you remember that one? Where the rich man, he had plenty. He was dressed in purple and, and he would have so much to eat that even his dogs would be full from eating all the scraps off his table. Yeah, there were those really pudgy dogs, you know, that have just been so well fed their whole life that they can barely waddle. That's, that's my imagination, at least. It doesn't describe it like that in Scripture. But. but meanwhile, right outside the gate, who's sitting there? It's Lazarus. He doesn't have enough money for medicine. He doesn't have enough money for clothes. He doesn't have enough money for food. For food, and they both die at the same time. And one of them lived righteously and one of them did not. And I think there's a clear verdict right there. And James is fleshing it out for them right here. He's fleshing it out. This is what's going to happen to you. This is the charges that God is going to levy against you. You've hoarded. You've been selfish, self-centered, and, and you've murdered. 
And yet, at the same time, some people, when they read that last verse, they see it as a reference to how the rich Pharisees and Sadducees murdered Jesus, the innocent one. To which it's true. I mean, and, and he wasn't very wealthy, right? And yet, Jesus is the one who was wealthy and became poor on our behalf. And he poured out his riches of grace and mercy on us. In another way, too, I guess you could say, yes, it is an offense against Jesus. It is attacking the innocent one because what does Jesus say about the least of these? He says, whatever you do to the least of these, you do unto me. And so Jesus takes the treatment of the poor, the orphans and the widows personally. James already said in the beginning of uh, this book that true religion is caring for these exact people which the wealthy are murdering, which they're by their selfish lifestyle and omitting justice for them, they're forsaking them unto death. Friends, don't let that be said about us as a church, as a people, as individuals. Let that not be said about us. Jesus, who was rich, became poor for us to pour out his wealth on us that he might bless us and lift us up and we should do the same. Amen? Let's learn the right way and the right reasons to use our wealth. When God gave Israel his law, he laid it out clear. There's some safeguards against these exact problems we're seeing in our text. And um, there's an abundance of instructions to how we're supposed to treat the poor, how the covenant community of God was supposed to treat the poor. For instance, Deuteronomy 24, 14, and 15 says, Israel is not to take advantage of uh, uh, the paid workers, but to pay them before the sun sets. Think about that. Pay them as soon as you can. As soon as you have the money in hand, pay them for their labor. Don't let it linger. Don't let any debt remain outstanding. Deuteronomy 15 outlines how Israel should cancel debts among them every seven years or so so that people are not lost into poverty. In fact, God says to them that there should be no poor people among them. Nobody's scraping by not sure where their next meal is going to come from. That's part of the purpose of this forgiveness. But the, he adds this even more, right? It, it continues on. It's not just every seven years, but every 50 years, there's the year of Jubilee when not only are your debts going to be completely forgiven and erased, but those lands that you had to put up against a loan, those lands that you had lost are now returned to your family. You do not go without those things that you... You thought you had lost it all this time. Every 50 years, they return to the rightful owners. I love um, that in Deuteronomy 14, 28 through 29, it calls for provisions for every few years, that they should gather provisions specifically for orphans and widows. It's a shorter period of time because they may have a shorter period of time. Add to that the practice then, Additionally, that Israel was commanded, hey, leave gleanings, leave stuff out for people who may not have money to be able to gather so they can harvest for themselves and survive from year to year, as it's described in Leviticus 19.19. 19. I mean, think about just these practices here. If Israel sincerely, earnestly practiced them on a regular basis, how different would they be from every other nation around the world? They'd be so radically different but in the best way, right? They'd be so strange. They'd be like, you guys are weird, but that's good. We like that. Can we be part of that community? It would be an attractive part of the community, isn't it? I think that's one of the things that was one of the first most attractive parts of the Christian community in the book of Acts, right? That if there was anyone in need, they shared what they had among them. They made sure that no one went without. I think this is something that we need to be thinking about even still today because there's so much more scripture about how we should care for the poor. Jesus even said, hey, you're always going to have them among you, so care for them, love them. But I believe, uh, as I mentioned before, in 1 Timothy 6, there's some great advice for how we should look at our wealth, some attitudes that the Apostle Paul teaches Timothy. In verses 17 through 19, he says, command those who are rich in the present world, not to be arrogant. Not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. You hear that? 
everything that God gives you, he did provide you for enjoyment, not obsession, not hoarding, not for just a pleasure-filled lifestyle, but for the joy that you can experience in the Lord of sharing it, of using it, of praising him for everything you receive. Okay, let's continue on. He says in verse 18, he says, command them to do good and to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. I like that last phrase. They'll take hold of life that is truly life, real life, the way God designed it is not for us to be obsessed with our wealth, not to be obsessed with our riches, not to be unjust with all the things that he has given us, but to be humble, generous, faith-filled, and faithful servants to others. Next week, we're going to talk about some counsel that James gives, which I believe is directly tied to this in the way that we may view the rich. Because some of you may be like, yeah, man, it's tough. I've, I've been oppressed. I've experienced this kind of thing in my life. Um, He's going to counsel us to be patient and endure, even though we may be oppressed and we may be troubled, to keep moving on, not, not just fight back and lash out at the wealthy, but to, but to be patient and to trust God's righteous judgment, that he's going to bring justice in his perfect time. I hope you make a point to make a priority to be here for that study. It's going to be good stuff. Um, but right now, let's approach our loving, lavishly generous throne of our our loving God, and let's thank him for all the good things he does give us. Let's praise him for that, and let's ask him to begin to peel back that tight grip we tend to have on these things and help us to honor him with everything that we have, especially this amazing promise of salvation that we have. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you, and we pray that our hands are open wide that we're holding nothing back and that nothing else is holding us back, that we are not in love with money, that we are not in love with a way of lifestyle that should we lose it, we, we would lose faith in you, God, but help us to trust in you and to honor you with every good thing that we receive because every good thing does come from you, our Father of lights. And Lord, we recognize that you hate injustice. And if there's any way in which we have treated people unjustly in our business practices, in our life, if we've withheld or, or, or been deceptive with our money, Lord God, would you again help us to release that and seek your face for forgiveness and make things right? God, call us closer to you in the way that we deal with this thing. This, this money issue can be a huge trap for all of us when we recognize it today. And Lord, I pray for anyone who might be listening, who might begin to be recognizing this sin in their life, Lord, maybe even for the first time, and they're starting to see their selfishness and their sin and their greed, Lord, I pray that you would call to their heart and that they would make the decision today to to repent of their sins, to turn back to you, to trust in you for the forgiveness of their sins, especially if they haven't yet done that in their life. I pray that today would be their first day when they would trust in you, turn away from their sins and ask you for forgiveness and receive that amazing gift that you offer us from the cross, that you died in our place for our sins while we were still sinners because you so loved us. Oh God, please let us revel in this joy and in this wonder and how you became poor in order to pour your riches out on us. Help us to honor you as we go from here. In the mighty, awesome, and powerful name of Jesus, amen. Hey, one last thing. Uh, If you're watching online, don't forget you can still give online through our church website or through the Give Plus app. And also we have those boxes at our exits. Uh, Please make use of that. Um, Otherwise, let's stand and receive this morning's benediction. Go as those who have received richly from the Lord and be generous to all that you meet for his glory and his name's sake. Amen. God bless you guys and have an awesome week. Oh yeah, by the way, uh, there's also free donuts out in the lobby if you're interested. You can take off your masks and eat them.
as long as you're, you know, social distance, all that. <laughs>